absolutely are. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Eileen Kapsoftis, and she is going to be talking about how food impacts arthritis, except she's gone. <laughs> she was here a minute ago. So maybe I can hold down the fort. No. Ah, there she is. Okay. That was scary. Oh, please come back. Yay. Are you back, Eileen? I see it in the waiting room. Let's ask to start video, ask to unmute. This doesn't usually happen at the top of the show. Is Mercury in retrograde? Any of you? Astrologically minded people know. I see her in the waiting room. I swear she was here before we started. And this is a topic I know nothing about. Uh oh, spaghetti. Well, I'll just say hello to people in the chat till she can get on. Hello, JL, Karen, Angela, Nim, Debbie, Stacy, Melissa, the usual suspects. Oh, darn. Why did this have to? I, I, I have her phone. You guys want to talk about something until until she joins us? Because, or I could just stop the broadcast and go back on, which I don't like to do when there's so many of you here. She was here. We were talking. How was everybody's weekend? Okay, I finally got unmuted. Oh my! There goodness. we go. You gave me a heart. I was hitting my clicker fifty thousand miles a minute, and it just wasn't turning anything on. Oh, I'm <laughs> so glad you text you. I'm so glad you're back because this isn't a topic I know anything about. So we're going to need you for this one for sure. How are you doing, Eileen? I know. <laughs> I know. It's really stressful when technology doesn't work. I know. Yes, and I know you have a bunch of people watching and I don't want to disappoint anybody. So. Well, you won't. so I know you have a presentation for us. And if you'd like, you can start it right away. Or if you just want to spend a few minutes just telling people who you are, what you do and how you found out about the plant based world. All right, well, I will start with that. It might help me calm down a little before I hit my slides and pray all the buttons work now. Um, yeah, I've been uh, helping people get out of pain now for about 27 years. And uh, it's funny because when I was a kid, I wanted to be a doctor. And then when I got older, I realized I wasn't in love with the medical model of treating symptoms. I, I, I have the utmost respect for physicians. Anybody who goes to school for 12 years to help people is a really good person. Um, it's just the medical model is not my favorite. So I ended up wanting to go into nutrition, but I didn't necessarily agree with they were teaching the four food groups at the time. I'm showing my age now. And, uh, and so I ended up becoming a PT. But then fast forward, I ended up uh, getting a diploma in nutrition education. So now I use this four prong approach to help people get out of pain. I've been helping people over Zoom now for years, long before the world shut down. And um, while a lot of my skills are in manual work, my favorite thing to do is to teach people how to fix themselves. I want to empower people, right? Teach a person to fish. And so, and food is a huge, huge piece of that. And most people don't understand that. I would have people come into the clinic who were in pain from head to toe. And, uh, and unless we addressed what they were putting in their mouth, we were just going to be chasing our tails, trying to get them out of pain. So... So that's why I put this together and hopefully um, it will help people. Yeah, I know very few doctors address what goes in. Yes, yes, but our favorites do, right? That's right. Well, Lifestyle Medicine, medicine and doctors. Dr. Barnard and Dr. Esselstyn and yeah, I could go on and on. Well, plant-based doctors, but a lot that goes on like, you know, when you see physical therapists, which are wonderful, I go all the time for different things. They don't address the root cause of why the back hurts so much because the vessels are, you know, they, they, that almost never comes up. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, all right, I'm going to share my screen and hope these buttons work today. Here we are. How's that? Is that working? Perfect. All right. Excellent. So um, I really do want to share with everybody, uh, you know, I do have contact information. I did provide a um, free chapter from my book for people who want to learn a little bit more about what it is that I do so that nobody has to buy anything, they can just check it out. And, um, and anybody who wants to, you know, go anywhere or contact me, sometimes people watch this, as you said, it's, they watch it recorded, they won't be here live. And they might think of a question, I'll do my best to answer the questions I get. Obviously, I can't diagnose anybody or treat them over an email. 
but I'll try to provide general resources that'll be helpful. So, all right. So I want to talk about pain today. I'm going to specify it as in relationship to food. Obviously, I could go on and on about different things, but this is one of my favorite statements um, that I make to people. I think everybody needs to be informed. Uh, it definitely helps them to make better choices and have much more improved outcomes. And so this, that's what this is about, is informing people. So I'm going to spend just about two minutes on some data, just so people understand how impactful this topic is. The National Institutes of Health tells us that pain affects more Americans and most of the Western world, actually, uh, than the top three diseases combined. These are the top three diseases that affect human misery and mortality, and pain affects more than that. It is the number one reason to seek medical care. And uh, a lot of people are unaware, but the top 10 reasons people goes to a doctor, seven of them have to do with pain. The other three are a, a post-surgical follow-up, updating medications, and a, and a checkup. Uh, the rest are all having to do with pain. And then it's a very expensive issue, right? It's over $100 billion a year. So you think we'd be pretty good at addressing it if that's the amount of money we're spending. Unfortunately, that's not the case. One in three people currently have had chronic pain um, uh, sorry, two thirds of, of those people for more than five years. So a lot of people are suffering and currently 100 million people just in this country alone are living with chronic pain. Uh, just a couple more slides on data. I don't want people's eyes to glaze over. So um, American Pain Society, it's kind of sad that we have something called the American Pain Society, but they tell us that it's the second leading cause of loss of work right? Pain. Uh, National Sleep Foundation tells us that one in three people loses more than 20 hours of sleep a month due to chronic pain. And, you know, pain is very fatiguing. Even when you're awake, it drains your energy. And, and it's very hard to function when you're dealing with pain. When it comes to back pain, eight out of 10 people will have back pain at some point in time in their life. And more than half of that 100 billion spent on pain every year is spent on back pain alone. And we're not very successful in treating it, generally speaking. People are living with pain. So moving into to the actual damage and injury that occurs to the body, we're, we're gonna talk about joint pain. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention tells us that one third to one half of this country's population, and again, we can translate this to a great deal of the Western world, develops degenerative joint disease or osteoarthritis. And OA is the leading cause of chronic disability in the US. It's the leading cause. So it seems to me it's a really good idea to figure out why is this happening? Can we prevent it? Can we reverse it? What can we do about it, right? So it's, it's joint damage. And, and I put a little picture up here just to give people an idea. You can see the picture on the left that's normal that's articular cartilage. Articular cartilage does not have any nerve endings in it. So if the joint is malaligned and it's rubbing, you won't feel any pain. But once that articular cartilage is rubbed away, bone is very highly innervated. And so that's where that bone on bone pain happens. But as you can see, the degenerative joint is very inflamed and it's the inflammation that does the damage to the cartilage and to the bone. So somebody had the bright idea of doing a study at Stanford University School of Medicine, and they wanted to determine what is the primary cause of joint damage. And they determined that it is not compression. It's not wear and tear. And, and I used to say this to my patients because, you know, they would come in and they would say, you know, they'd have a, maybe they had a joint replacement in the right knee. And I would say, well, how is your left knee? And they'd say, oh, it's fine. You know, it, it's, you know, but the reason they told me they had the joint replacement is because the joint was worn out. You know, they're older, maybe they're in their seventies, uh, even eighties. Uh, and I tell them, I go, well, were you hopping around on one leg your whole life? How come only one knee wore out? Why didn't both knees wear out? Doesn't make sense to me, right? If it's age or compression. So the Stanford University School of Medicine did this study, and this is what they determined was the primary cause of joint damage, chronic inflammation. And so if it's chronic inflammation, then it's not compression or wear and tear, right? 
And so I did a lot of research. I, I created an obesity and pain course um, for Food Choices Academy. And I spent months and months buried in research. But what we find is the number one cause of chronic inflammation, and I'm even adding impaired circulation here, is the standard American diet. I mean, we are putting things into our mouth that promote this. And I know we don't have a lot of time today, so I'm, I'm limited in how much information I'm sharing here, but I, I tried to do my best to get the most important points here. So many of us are confused, right? Because we're told how many of you have gone to the doctor and they tell you, oh, you are getting older, you know, well, at your age, it's expected, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. You're going to just need to learn to live with it or, you know, take this medication or maybe have this procedure or this surgical um, intervention. But, but it's, you know, most of us are confused. And especially now that I just said, it's not wearing terror old age, right? So, these are some common inflammatory conditions, and you may be surprised to see the, the specifically muscular low back pain and muscular neck pain here, because these are, can be inflammatory conditions. Now, it's not always the case. Someone can fall and end up with a posterior sacral torsion, or they could end up with, um, you know, a lack of function in their power source, which is the glutes. That's your power source. Believe it or not, your glutes are what you're using to push open a heavy door, to get out of a chair, to bend over and, and lift something out of the trunk of the car. And a lot of us are sitting on our glutes all the time now, right? So they weaken, they, they get flaccid, they atrophy, and people lose strength, and then that creates chronic pain. But, but these can be inflammatory conditions. And it's important for people to understand that because if you're doing all the right things, except how you're nourishing your body, this may be your answer if you're struggling with chronic pain. So here's some of the common symptoms of inflammation, and, and none of this is a surprise to anyone, right? Redness, swollen joints, pain, stiffness, um, but generalized pain and muscular pain can be symptoms of inflammation. Uh, most of us are familiar with the stiffness part, especially if it's osteoarthritis. Very commonly, when someone's been sitting for a while and they get up, they feel stiff and they have to move around a little bit before they feel better. Or when they get up in the morning, they feel very stiff and they have to move around for a while. Well, that stiffness may or may not be osteoarthritic in nature. I mean, there are some other things that can do that. We can have a, a, a fascial dehydrated, compressed uh, area of the body and treating the fascia can, can eliminate that stiffness. It can be that a muscle has kind of locked short because we're sitting so much, the front hip muscles can lock short and they're not used to getting longer and stabilizing us when we stand up. So they have to kind of, oh, you're gonna make me get longer now. And so you'll feel the stiffness there. So there are other reasons. I don't want anyone to think this is the only one, but this is one most people don't think about. And so that's why I wanted to share this today. So uh, I'm going to share three causes of chronic pain when it comes to the topic I'm presenting here today. One is food and inflammation. The other is excess weight and inflammation. And the third is food and impaired circulation. So the first question to ask is, how does food promote chronic inflammation? And I'm going to go into this not in a great deal of detail. I, I don't want to, you know, just slam a whole bunch of studies at people, but I did um, provide a few on each of these questions. So the, the biggest reason that food can promote pain in the body is because animal foods specifically contain high amounts of arachidonic acid. And I'm sure you're familiar with all of this, AJ, um, but, but I'm trying to present this in a way where people see it as a pain issue, right? So arachidonic acid is an inflammatory omega-6 fatty acid. It stim stimulates the production of pro-inflammatory chemicals. So it's promoting inflammation in the body. And when you get too much arachidonic acid, it leads the body to over-respond with inflammation during the normal healing and repair process. Our body is, is healing and repairing on a cellular level pretty much 24-7 right? We've all heard that, you know, you're a whole new body every six or seven years because all the cells are, are not the same ones you had a long time ago. But, but the point is, is that it's supposed to shunt. It's supposed to kind of turn off or reverse. And if we're overloaded with arachidonic acid from our food supply, from what we're eating, 
that that doesn't happen. It gets stuck on. It's like putting a brick on the gas pedal. It just gets overloaded. And, and that inflammatory process just does not shunt or reverse. So arachidonic acid is important, um, but we don't need to be consuming it directly. It can be converted as needed from the linoleic acid from plant oils. So if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, you're going to get everything you need for your body to make the amount of arachidonic acid that it needs at the time. So it's not going to be struggling with an oversupply. It's not going to make more than it needs. It's not going to convert more than it needs, or people are getting it directly from meat, poultry, fish, eggs, seafood, uh, dairy, all of the animal food sources. Now, um, this, this is an interesting fact. And, and I know that you've had, um, Dr. Michael Greger on your, your show many times, and this was from his website, nutrition, nutritionfacts.org. But the amount of arachidonic acid found in just one egg a day elevates arachidonic acid levels in the bloodstream. So it doesn't take much for us to get an oversupply of arachidonic acid, which will lead to promoting that chronic inflammation, which will lead to joint damage. And then according to the USDA standard 13 and 16 databases, meat, poultry, eggs, seafood, fish, including salmon, and many people believe salmon is this magic health food because of the omega-3 in it, it does have a lot of the six, which is, is, is arachidonic acid directly. Um, these foods produce the highest amounts in the body. Fruits, veggies, grains, legumes, beans, lentils produce little or no arachidonic acid in the body and processed baked goods produce a moderate amount. And this is the interesting part. I'm guessing no matter what side of the fence people sit on when it comes to diet, whether they're paleo, Atkins, vegan, whatever, I think everybody can agree on this one point. I've never heard anybody write a book with a title that says eat donuts for health, right? Everybody knows that baked goods are not good for us. So we can all agree on something. So, and of course I had to put this in there, what about protein? Because everybody says, well, if we can't eat all the animal foods, where are we getting our protein? And I, I just put this very tiny little chart here. You can see all of these beautiful foods on the left are very high in protein. And, and so it's not, and, and I didn't wanna get off on a tangent, obviously, you know, people think of the complete protein and incomplete protein, right? Or superior and inferior protein. And it's just because of all the amino acids in the animal foods and only some of them in plant foods. But we know that you get all you need. You just need to eat a variety of plants and they don't have to all be consumed at the same time. So nobody's ever, and I've heard Dr. McDougall say this many times, no one has ever been diagnosed with a protein deficiency, as long as they're consuming enough calories. So uh, we know that that can't happen. Okay, here's the second question. How does excess weight promote chronic inflammation? And this, is, this can be a little bit of a touchy um, subject. You know, this isn't about me picking on people who are carrying excess weight. This is explaining why um, specifically excess weight and obesity tends to coincide with chronic pain in people's bodies. Fat cells produce inflammatory cytokines. And I remember listening to um, an expert many years ago who, this was before we knew this stuff because we've learned a lot in the last 20 years. But uh, 20 years ago, this person was saying that if you looked at a fat cell in a microscope, under a microscope, it would just stare back at you. It does nothing right? So it doesn't burn any calories. It doesn't require any caloric intake to maintain itself. That was his point. And then he said, if you stare at a muscle cell under the microscope, it's like the 4th of July. There's so much energy being used in that muscle cell. It requires a caloric intake to maintain itself, right? So that was his point. But we've learned in the last 20 years that fat cells do not just lay there and do nothing. They do produce inflammatory cytokines. They do promote chronic inflammation in the body, which tends to do more damage to joints and create chronic pain. And those inflammatory cytokines, they're little proteins. They're, they're like messengers between the cells. They go back and forth, kind of telling each other what's going on and, and what to do. They trigger things. They'll bind to target immune cells, triggering the immune response. And the immune response is inflammation, right? And so if we have excess of these cytokines, it can lead to inflammation and tissue destruction. So 
I'm going to go over just a few studies here on some of this, just to, to show you this isn't just my opinion, this is being seen in the data. So when it comes to excess weight and pain, there is a definite association between joint pain and obesity. And, and there's lots and lots of studies. Like I said, I spent months researching this topic. Um, many studies indicate that obesity is related to not just the fact the person is experiencing osteoarthritis, but it's also related to how much it progresses, how fast it progresses and how severe it gets. Those with a BMI of 40 or higher have 33 times higher risk of a total hip replacement and a nine times higher risk of a total knee replacement than those who are not obese. So we're seeing this in the literature and, and there's tons of it and, and I'm only presenting a few studies here. Uh, I did wanna put this in here mainly because um, there, there are people who are sharing the information and it's great information that improved cartilage thickness is seen from walking and weight bearing activity, but this is not seen in the obese population. So I wanted to put this out there because I think it's important to protect people from making wrong decisions, right? From lack of information. So exercise choices are important if you're carrying exercise weight. So it's really important to do non-impact aerobic work right, like bicycling or something uh, to, to improve cardiovascular fitness and all of the other benefits, but also to burn body fat and, and to help with uh, normalizing weight, but minimizing the joint stress. And then once the weight is lost, then the weight bearing can occur um, to help improve that cartilage thickness. So um, back to the weight loss. So the Framingham study, which is a huge study, uh, went on for decades, um, it showed the risk of developing knee osteoarthritis was reduced by half when weight loss of just five kilograms, which I think uh, a, a pound is 2.2 kilograms, I think. So we're only looking at about 12 pound weight loss um, when that occurred in the 10 years prior to the assessment. So you can really reduce your risk of osteoarthritis with weight loss. And there's tons of studies. I'm just going to show a couple here. Um, those who lost at least 10% of their body weight had improved levels of pain and better function and 10%, you know, that's not a huge, that's not, you know, 200 pounds they had to lose. Um, those who engaged in both exercise and better diet had better outcomes. So obviously exercise is important, right? We've got to get moving. A lot of people are in pain just because they're not moving. Motion is lotion. I love to say, and when you just sit still forever, you're going to be stiff and sore, no matter what you eat, you've got to be moving. But the more weight that was lost, they had less inflammation, more mobility, faster walking speed, improved health related quality of life. So lots of good things for those who did both exercise and better diet. Um, but the weight loss, it's dose dependent as far as how people felt. The more weight people lost, the better they felt. Um, those who lost 10% of body weight showed more improvement than those who lost between five and 10. And those did better than those who lost only 5%. So, so the, the more loss, the better the results. And then I want to talk a little bit about just food. And I, and I could, again, share lots of studies. But this one, I think, is a good one to share here. Um, this looked at over 6,000 Americans in two different studies. Um, it was the osteoarthritis initiative of almost 5,000. It was like about 4,800 people. And then the Framingham offspring osteoarthritis study, which included over 1,200 people. And they followed them every single year. Um, the osteoarthritis initiative they followed for four years. Uh, the Framingham they followed for nine years. And what they found was those who ate more fiber and I'm pretty sure everybody who watches your show knows that fiber is only in plants. Animal foods do not have any fiber, not a stitch. Um, and so the, the top consumers had a 61% lower chance of symptomatic osteoarthritis. Now I, I need to explain, you can see ROA here and, and SXOA. The ROA was the, the imaged right? The, 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 um, when they took the, the results of the imaging and then the SX is the symptoms they were experiencing and reporting. So the people who ate more fiber had a much lower chance of symptoms for their osteoarthritis. Now, the interesting part is the relationship with the imaging was unclear. Now, these were just people eating more fiber. It didn't say anything about their animal food intake 
Uh, it didn't say anything, you know, about those other things. Were they consuming a lot of oils? Were they doing things to impair circulation? We don't know. We only know that they were eating more fiber and that did lessen their symptoms dramatically. Okay, the second question I wanna look at is how does food, or I think this might be the third one, I lost track. Uh, how does food impair blood supply? And so fat and cholesterol consumption is known, well known to impair circulation in the body. And many people are being told, you know, to pour that olive oil all over their food because of the omega-3 uh, benefits, but uh, it, that's less than accurate. And I'm gonna show some studies about that, but we'll, we'll start off with food that people know for sure is loaded with fat and cholesterol. A single meal of sausage and eggs can literally stick the blood cells together leading to less than optimal blood flow and oxygenation of the tissues. So this picture here, these are red blood cells floating around in the blood and, and looking good, single file. Anybody who knows anything about anatomy knows that your smallest blood vessel that supplies things to the tissues like nutrition and oxygen is the capillary. And the capillary is only one cell wall thick, very, very tiny. And so the red blood cells can only go through single file. And uh, for a, a, some time, I taught anatomy and physiology to third and fourth graders and had a ball doing it. And I would have them line up like they were the capillary. And then the other kids holding the red construction paper, they were the red blood cells, and they could only go through one at a time, single file. So what happens, you can see these red blood cells on the right, they're all clumped together what happens if they're all clumped together? It's gonna to impair circulation. They're gonna really struggle getting through the capillaries to provide what's needed to the body on a cellular level. So it's really going to impair your circulation, right? So I, I like to show pictures because pictures are worth a thousand words. And uh, this is just the blood supply to the spine. Um, people don't realize just how vascular their spine is. And I know we all get concerned about impaired circulation when it comes to heart attacks and strokes. We want to protect our heart. We want to protect our brain, very important organs. But your whole body requires a good blood supply. And the spine is no different than the brain and the heart. I mean, they need, your spine needs a really good blood supply. And so what happens is uh, one of my favorite researchers, and, and I got to, I actually went to, um, one of the PCRM conferences in Washington, well, I've been to several of them, but um, the one that was in 2015, uh, because the title of it was cardiovascular disease, um, was the title of the conference. And Dr. Lena Kapila from Finland was doing a presentation called, um, I believe her presentation was back pain and cardiovascular disease. I, I, I might be slaughtering the title. But I was fascinated with that and I had to go. And I know you've been there, AJ, to their conferences and you know just how heavily attended they are. Well, it was, it was just this, you know, God was smiling on me. I ended up sitting right behind Dr. Kapila and I didn't even know it. And she went up to do her presentation and came back and I was able to have a conversation with her. But I'm only gonna share one of her studies, but I could paper the wall in my office with how many studies the woman has, has published. She's just prolific in her research. In this one study, what she showed was the subjects had atherosclerosis. So they were showing heart disease or, or cardiovascular disease by the age of 10 years old. Now that's pretty sad. And she was seeing 10% advanced blockages by the age of 20. That's just in this one study. And what she found was these blockages were happening at the opening of the lumbar arteries which are the blood vessels that supply blood to the lumbar spine. And what she saw in this particular study was the greater the blockage at the lumbar arteries, the greater the disc degeneration was also seen. So how many of us think that we shrink just because of age, right? It's again, it's wear and tear, it's compression. Our spine is meant to get all you know, compressed. That's not true. I mean, I'm going to be 63 next month and I'm still five foot four. I've been five foot four since my teens. I have not shrunk. And so I, I, it's not wear and tear. It's not compression. Your discs are not meant to flatten with age. 
This is really a circulatory issue. This is impaired circulation to the lumbar arteries. And so here's another visual for those of you who can't figure that out. This is, you know, look at the blood supply to the spine. Well, what's going to happen when that's diminished? And Dr. Capilla did some really impressive work. I mean, there are three main branches to the lumbar arteries, and she can tell you the symptoms that are common dependent on which branch has impaired circulation. Her work is just phenomenal. Uh, she might be somebody you'd like to have on your show. I, I think she'd be great. So, so as you can see here, this is a disc and, and it, it's got to get blood supply. It just has to be there. And this picture shows nice, normal, healthy discs between the vertebrae here. And the picture on the right shows not so much. And so a lot of us, if we're thinking it's age and wear and tear and it's not, we need to be informed, right? This just might um, motivate someone to make some changes in their, in their food intake if they know that this could improve. And I know that um, there is something called angiogenesis, and I didn't create any slides for that, but it's called birth of new blood vessels. And the body will create angiogenesis. I mean, it'll do it for the heart, especially when people have the, the one main artery in the uh, artery to the heart muscle itself, the one that's called the widow maker, because if that one gets blocked, most people don't survive. The body will actually do an angiogenesis tactic and grow, try to grow blood supply around that blacked artery, right? Well, then we'll also do it to um, injured areas of the body to promote healing. And then it will kind of resorb those, those added blood vessels that it no longer needs once the healing is done. So the body goes through this process. And so if you're exercising, the muscles need more blood supply, right? So my thoughts are why sometimes people might have this impaired blood supply, but feel better with exercise is because they're getting some angiogenesis results, which is great. Um, but it also could be, you know, their power source is not working. There's always that. All right. And then of course, what about the healthy fats, which many people, right. And, and I know that your audience is well-versed on this, but I didn't want to leave this out. And so I'm going to share just, I think I've got three or four studies here on the oils and how they impair circulation. So this has to do with pain, right? This has to do with lumbar artery disease. And if you've got lumbar artery impaired circulation, you've got it impaired everywhere, right? So this one compared angiograms. So they're actually looking at coronary artery disease patients. So this means that their actual heart uh, blood supply is impaired. And what they found was the disease, CAD, progressed just as much for those eating a diet high in monounsaturated, which is basically olive oil, um, as those eating saturated fats. So no difference at all. This study, the University of Maryland actually called it olive oil. And they saw that it reduced dilation to the brachial artery, which is the artery in the arm. And so when it talks about injury to the endothelial cells, those are little tiny cells that line all of our blood vessels. So, so think about, um, you know, this lining of, of endothelial cells and they rule, they produce nitric oxide. They do all kinds of things that really impacts our circulation. And when we injure them, now everything breaks loose. And so um, I, I won't get off on that tangent. Um, that's more when I'm talking about heart disease, but, but if they're injured, they don't produce enough nitric oxide. And when they don't produce enough nitric oxide, the blood vessels will constrict. They won't dilate, they won't get nice and big, they'll get smaller. And we don't want that to happen. And a lot of people aren't aware, that's how Viagra works it increases the production of nitric oxide. And there was actually a speaker at that same conference I attended with Dr. Capilla, whose title of his talk was um, erectile dysfunction, the canary in the coal mine. He was saying those who have that, it's, it's you know, that's their first sign that they do have uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, it just hasn't been diagnosed yet, right? So it's important that we don't injure those blood vessels and oil does that. Uh, both omega-3 and omega-6 contribute to the development of plaques damaging the arteries. There's tons and tons of data that shows this. And so the, this is a conclusion of one of these studies, a direct influence of dietary. So consuming these polyunsaturated fats 
it has a direct influence on plaque formation. So they suggest the current trends favoring increased intake of these should be reconsidered. Uh, it's not a good idea. And then fish oils. They really do not protect us. There's no evidence of reduced risk of events. So people having heart attacks, people having strokes, people dying from increasing their consumption of these. Um, you know, this was a large study. They, they looked at 89 different studies and they could not find any evidence of this. So finishing up on oils, they are not health foods. They are concentrated in fat and calories. One tablespoon has 130 calories. And if you consume three tablespoons of olive oil a day, which is easy to do if you follow the mainstream recommendations, you're getting a lot of extra calories every 10 days, and it can lead to a weight gain of 36 pounds in just one year. So, you know, just one tablespoon of olive oil, we're looking at, you know, that's if you don't make any other changes in your caloric intake, right? But we don't want to damage those endothelial cells. I just put this in here because we talked about weight, excess weight, and a lot of people struggle to lose weight because they haven't given up the oils. So we really need to eliminate added oils from the diet. And so this is where I show my next confused slide because people are like, why are we keep getting told all these things then if it's not true, right? Um, and, and I wish I had an answer for that. Um, that's a whole nother topic. I'm sure um, that, that AJ, you've addressed more than once. So I love this quote by Dr. Robbins you know, we're looking for cures, right? Everybody wants the cure for cancer, the cure for diabetes, the cure for cardiovascular disease. Well, if we just look at what's causing it, it's so much easier, right? If we, if we stop the cause. And so if chronic pain, um, you know, we're looking for cures for chronic pain. And, and unfortunately, you know, when you, when you go to a pain specialist, when you go to a, a chronic pain specialist, what do they call themselves? They call themselves pain management. They don't call themselves pain resolution or, you know, we're going to get rid of your pain. We're going to manage your pain. And, and nobody wants pain managed. They want it gone, right? We can't, we can't address pain with all of these external medications and procedures um, I know, you know, I work with people for many, many years in this topic, and I've, I've met people who, you know, they're seeking an answer everywhere, and they're getting treated and, and, and receiving treatment from all these different professions, but they're not doing anything themselves. They're not addressing dietary changes. They're not addressing exercise and movement. They're, they're expecting everybody else to fix them. We have to kind of step up and take control over what we're putting in our mouth and the activities that we're performing, because we have control over this. And that's really good news, right? This means we don't have to be a victim. We don't have to, to hope we can find the answer somewhere because the answer really is in what we're putting in our mouth and then how we're treating and moving our bodies. So I, I'm a big one on cause. And as a matter of fact, my book, you know, it's called Pain Culprits for a reason, because a lot of the times, the area that's complaining, the area that's in pain is the victim. And the area that's causing it is the silent culprit. Nobody is paying attention. And so many times we're seen as this body part that walks through the door, right? You're, you, they see you as a knee that walks through a door or a shoulder that walks through the door. Well, guess what? Everything's connected to everything else. We, we, we don't take our shoulder off and put it on a shelf when we go to bed, right? Everything's connected. And I can tell you, and that's not the purpose of today, but I can tell you how your, your heel bone will create shoulder pain or neck pain. I can tell you directly how the ankle will impact those things, how the hips and the ankles will affect the knee. Uh, that 90% of the time, it's not the knee, it's above and below. So we have to look for the cause of things. We have to see people as a whole person, right? And not these, these systems, you know, seeing a, a cardiovascular specialist and a rheumatologist and a, all these people who specialize in one area, we need a much more holistic approach. And what we're putting in our mouth is the best place to start. And so 
you know, this picture, these foods look amazing, right? And those of us who are used to eating a whole food plant-based diet, you know, this might make us drool a little bit. You know, I love these foods. I'm going to show a picture in a little bit of foods that people who aren't used to eating this way might find more tantalizing, right? Because it's not, a lot of people say, I don't want to graze, you know, out on the lawn. I don't want to eat all that. You know, they all think that plant-based eating is boring and, and you can't really do anything. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. And I know from your recipes, you know that as well. Um, but the right foods can reduce or even eliminate pain, right? We want to get rid of pain. We, we don't want to manage it. We want to get rid of it. So I did want to show, um, this is one, of, when I came across this study, I was like, okay, why didn't this get published on the front page of every newspaper in the country, right? This study was done on diabetic neuropathy, which is one of the most painful things to experience in human existence. You get sharp shooting pains. Usually it's to the feet. Sometimes it includes the hands. It can be to other parts of the body, but it's horrible, painful existence. And so what they did was they decided to see how would a low fat plant-based diet affect diabetic neuropathy. So they eliminated animal foods completely. They restricted the fat intake and they focused on plants, right? And then the intervention, intervention patients experienced significant improvement in pain, significant improvement in pain. I mean, this is crazy that people don't know this stuff, right? They even did an electrochemical skin conductance in the foot, worsened in the control group. So I'll explain this a little bit. When you've got diabetic neuropathy, you have nerve damage and, and you start to lose feeling you, you'll still have pain, but you won't feel the floor that well. You'll kind of have some numbness. You'll have some issues with feeling where you are in space. These people really struggle with balance, you know, dynamic stability, because if you can't feel the floor with your foot, it's really kind of hard to walk with good stability, right? So it, can, it worsens, and they do this, this skin conductance test to see how well the nerves are working in the feet. And typically, decline is imminent. Once you start having this, this damage, this injury to these nerves, it continues to worsen over time. And what they saw in this study, they saw those who did not change their diet, that skin conductance worsened, but it stayed constant in the intervention group. So it did not worsen. So this indicated that the diet may have slowed that nerve function decline. Now, this study wasn't really long. I think it was about 12 weeks. Um, if my memory serves me correctly, I've read a lot of studies over the years, but, but that doesn't mean that over time it might not improve, right? We don't know. The study wasn't done long enough, but we know it didn't worsen. And then here's the best part. Over 80% of the people in the intervention group reported complete remission, complete remission. I mean, I want to say that 10 times. It's like, oh my gosh, their pain was resolved no more burning pain, and they experienced an improved sense of touch. And then the other 19% reported some improvement in symptoms. So this is a 100% positive response to changing diet when it comes to diabetic neuropathy. So why isn't this headline news, right? It should be. And, and I, I, you know, I, I have to stop myself. I get a little bit passionate here. But, but, you know, I think I'm, the reason I'm breathing on this planet is because my, my whole purpose for being here is to help people to get out of pain uh, and to have a better life. And it just, the human misery that's occurring out there because of the lack of information just, just freaks me out. So I was, that's why I'm so glad. I'm humbled and honored to be on this so I can share this information. So um, here's a study that talks about inflammation in food. This one specifically cruciferous veggies, right? Our broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, all those kind of veggies. And they divided, this was over a thousand people they looked at and they divided them into five groups based on how many of these cruciferous veggies they ate every single day. The lowest fifth ate about a half a cup. The highest fifth ate about a cup and a half. And then they compared markers for inflammation. These tumor necrosis factor, TNF, interleukin-6, these are blood biomarkers of inflammation going on in the body. And they compared them based on the amount of cruciferous veggies they ate. And what they found 
was that those markers were 13 and 25% lower in those women who ate um, the least as compared to those women who ate the most. So, so it just, we really need to, um, sorry, I think I might have that backwards, how that's written. I put it in other words down below, the less vegetables eaten related to higher levels of inflammation in their bodies and the higher amount of vegetables eaten related to lower levels of inflammation. So not sure if I've got that written backwards there. So, you know, if we want a pain-free life, we don't want to be eating boxed, shrink-wrapped and canned foods, right? And I love this picture because this is the area I live. I'm in upstate New York and I'm right across the border from Vermont where people actually say, can't get that from here. That's exactly how they say it, right? And, um, and so we're not going to become pain-free eating these types of foods, right? We want to reduce inflammation. We want to protect our circulation and we want to achieve a healthy weight with fresh live plant foods. And so this is the picture that uh, I said I was going to show. So for those of you who don't want to graze on your front lawn and you think eating a whole food plant-based diet is boring, these are amazing foods. Um, this gravy is made with no fat. Um, this is fettuccine Alfredo, completely low fat, vegan, using cauliflower to make the cream sauce. Cauliflower makes amazing cream sauce because it's 11% plant oils. So it just gives you that creamy mouthfeel. I remember I made um, scalloped potatoes at one of the events and there was a mother daughter sitting there and the daughter was maybe in her fifties and the mom in her seventies. And she looked at her mom and she said, this tastes just like yours. She was shocked. She was floored. I mean, her jaw was like this, right? So we don't have to suffer to, to, to feed ourselves so we can get out of pain. It, it's, it's possible, absolutely possible. So I love this statement as well. If somebody has been to more than four doctors, let's look at what they're putting in their mouth because it's really, really important that they understand that that is the first place to look, right? And then I love these statements. The right diet can prevent, stop, and even reverse disease and impact chronic pain. No stage at which dietary improvement cannot make things better. And it's really inexpensive to eat well. I had an assignment where I had to create for SNAP people, I had to create a diet for SNAP. And I was able to feed them. They ate six times a day, uh, two people on $8 a day. And so it is not expensive to eat well. People say it is, it's not. And this puts us in control of our health. And, you know, I, I put these dots here. If a drug could do for, and you name it, if a drug could do for chronic pain, what plants do, everyone would be taking it. If a drug could do for cancer, heart disease, diabetes, you put, put every, whatever you want in there, what plants do, everyone would be taking it. So it's so important that we work to keep ourselves healthy because, you know, we might be grateful for the things that are helping to elongate life, but, but we don't really want to be patients. I don't know about you. I don't want to be a patient. I don't want to ever be admitted to the hospital because something's wrong with me. All right. And I teased my husband, uh, oh my gosh, years and years ago when I first started, because I've worked in about every field there is acute care and osteo pathic and, and, us and uh, outpatient clinics and, and nursing home settings and, and home care and everything. And when I was in acute care for years, I told my husband, when we get older, if I get sick, shoot me and bury me in the backyard. Do not bring me to the hospital. I just don't want to go there. So, you know, I don't want to be a patient. And so, you know, really the true healthcare and pain management system or pain resolution system is really plant-based nutrition. And, you know, I have information here. Uh, I do have a monthly newsletter that goes out. I just started a new series on bone health. So September's was the first edition um, and then October will be going out. So it's, you know, I put out topics that have to do with pain and uh, having a healthy life. And I usually share a recipe and a tip of the month. And then for those of you who are interested in moving well and learning how to assess your body with three plane function and figuring out where the culprits are, 
there are um, there's lots of free content at this website for those who might be interested in that. And uh, I think that's about it as far as slides go. So I will stop sharing and see if there's any questions, which I'm guessing there are. There are. What a fabulous presentation. I felt like I was at a conference. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was wonderful. Well, the first one I see is from Colleen. Can neuropathy be reversed? So um, I haven't seen any data that says it can be reversed. That doesn't mean that things can improve. As I said, that one study wasn't done long enough. Um, and that was done by PCRM, by the way, by Dr. Neil Barnard, because of a study that was done prior to that, um, that showed that people many years later, I think about 70% of the subjects had stayed on the healthy diet because of the fact that they were relieved from pain. So it goes to show people will change their diet if it makes a difference in their life, right? Um, unfortunately, I haven't come across any data that, that shows definitely it can be reversed, but that doesn't mean that it can't be. It just means nobody's done a study on it. Nice. You know, that was so interesting what you said, because I heard that something like seven out of 10 visits to doctors in general were for lifestyle related things, but I never thought about that the reason they were going in the first place was because of pain. Yeah, yeah. Joint pain, back pain, shoulder pain, stomach pain, which is GI related. But All right. Well, that's so interesting. Just take a moment to thank Mary and Angela for their super chat donation. And there was a question that was uh, submitted in advance. So I'd like to get to it from Amy. And it is about something called a Theragun machine. If you believe in using it after workouts and how long do you recommend it on a muscle group, for example, her quads? Right. So, so that's a very specific question. And I, and I'm, I'm really reluctant to give anybody specific advice because when I do work with people in consulting, I get a very detailed history of their medical history, what's going on in their world, medications they're on past injuries, hip, you know, surgeries, the whole nine yards. And I assess them in their three plane function. Um, so there's a lot of devices that come out in the market and a lot of them have different names. I'm not familiar with that particular device, but I believe um, that we determined it was a massage type device. And so there's really no way for me to tell somebody how often or how long they should use something. And I don't mean to sound like I don't wanna give an answer. It's that typically if my favorite strategy for addressing muscle pain post exercise, well, for one thing, if you're doing a good workout, you're not going to be all that sore after because you're treating your body properly, right? If you're really sore after a workout, then you've probably overdone it. Um, you know, you're creating way too much lactic acid and your body's not good at um, going into an anaerobic phase. But, but the point is you really want to be um, ensuring that you're not overly sore after a workout. And if the goal is to promote circulation, after a workout, then massage can be helpful. But one of my very favorite strategies to, is the melt method. Um, I've been teaching that for about 11 years now. And what that does is that's a way for the person to treat themselves. It's a beautiful self-care method where they can improve circulation, decompress fascia, um, and, and, and rehydrate the body. And it's, it's a fabulous way at uh, addressing post-exercise soreness. So hopefully that answer helps. Great, thank you. And Katie said, can you repeat the name of your book and where to get it? I know you're oh, giving sure. each chapter. Absolutely, yeah. It's Pain Culprits is the name of the book. And I had sent a link um, to your person. Right. And I've been, post I've been posting it in the chat and in the show. Okay. And it's a, okay. it's a chapter. Right. It's a chapter of the book. Yeah. If they want the whole book, that's available on Amazon. Right. It's called Nab the Culprits without with and with move without and move without pain. Yep. Mm -hmm. Very yes. nice. So let's see. I do see questions, but see, because mine goes fast, they sometimes disappear. And we yes. oh, um, uh, Mark says, does does gluten such as bread cause inflammation in the body? So gluten is a very hairy topic. Um you know, there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of difference of opinion. Um, personally, from what I've seen in the data, the majority of the population is fine consuming gluten and they don't have any issues. 
Um, you know, from the last I looked at, it's like maybe 13 to 15 percent of the population that might be kind of dose dependent, which means they can get away with having a whole grain toast for breakfast, but they don't want to have whole grain pasta for supper. And then, you know, it's too much in one day. Um, but uh, and then there's two to three percent that actually have to be medically gluten restricted because of Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Um, most autoimmune issues do better staying away from gluten. But the majority of the population, I've not seen any data that says generally across the board, a healthy person should restrict gluten intake. Great. Thank you. Uh, Julie says she worked with you and had chronic pain and has been pain-free since working with you and loves the MELT method that you taught her. Oh, hi, Julie. That sounds great. So I'm looking for, oh, here's one. Are there any, you, you, well, see, some of these questions came in before you said it, but for example, any particular foods for osteopenia or osteoporosis? Oh, well, that my newsletter is talking about bone health. And, um, and so I go into the, the dark, dirty details of osteoporosis and um, how many women are being uh, intimidated um, kind of fear tactics to use medical strategies that are less than optimal. So what I find, you know, like the, the typical, and I'm not telling anybody to not take a medication, so don't hear what I'm not saying. Um, but if somebody is taking a bisphosphonate, for instance, which is the most common, right? Like Fosamax, those kind of things. Um, I can't think of the other rest of them off the top of my head, but the data shows that they really reduce the fracture risk by a very small amount, like maybe 2%. And what really reduces fracture risk is healthy eating and staying away from acid producing foods because your body pulls calcium from the bones to neutralize the acid. Our blood pH has this tiny little window, 7.35 to 7.45. And so it will do whatever it can to maintain life and so it takes calcium from the bones to do that. So we're literally flushing our bones down the toilet um, when we're eating a high acid load diet. And so my last month's newsletter and, and this month and next month will be, has a lot of detail on that. But there are so many foods that are really good for us that um, have plenty of calcium and we absorb what, you know, what we need, uh, you know, dark leafy greens, you know, there, there's tons of them. Um, and I showed charts and, and I, I'll be listing them in the newsletter, but, uh, but we really want to stay away from the acid forming foods because that's what makes us lose bone density. That's what makes us lose our calcium. It's, it's what we're, what we should not be eating. Right. Uh, Nobody wants to flush their bones down the toilet, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sandra says, what about increasing omega-3 fatty acids by using the plant-based oil from flax seeds to combat inflammation? Is that harmful? I would think so. So, well, the goal is not to consume oils, period. I know some people like to put flaxseed in their smoothies. I don't know that that's a horrible idea. Um, I haven't read that that will promote inflammation or limit inflammation, really. You know, you start getting into, and I am the first one to admit, I am certainly not a nutrition expert, right? Dr. Greger could get up here and tell you the long chain acids and the short chain and, and you know, give you the whole chemical breakdown. That's not me. Um, but but I, I, I don't purposely do that myself, I think, which is the best answer, because I think eating foods whole is so much more important. And, um, you know, my personal opinion is, is if we have to grind it up in order to eat it, maybe it's not really meant to be consumed daily, right? Because you can't get anything out of flaxseed unless you grind it. That's interesting. I love yeah. that. Let's see. Um, can vitamin D deficiency cause osteopenia or osteoporosis? There are some studies that are linking bone health to vitamin D. Um, I'm a big believer of, of making our own because it's a hormone. It's not a vitamin. And, uh, and, and I think that the general public has become the test subject as far as supplementation with vitamin D, because we don't know what that will do to anybody long-term. I know there's a lot of studies out there. I came across one that was fascinating. It was, um, people who entered the hospital who had to be stabilized, in order to save their life. They were in a life-threatening situation and they had to be stabilized. Well, prior to being stabilized, they did a whole bunch of blood work, right? Then they stabilized them. Then they did more blood work. 
they found those people had very like levels of vitamin D in the toilet before they stabilized them. And then the vitamin D levels were normal after they stabilized them and they didn't do anything about vitamin D. So th there's a lot of studies that show vitamin D is, is um, stored in the tissues and may not be circulating. So that questions now the validity of the blood tests, because if it's stored in my body's tissues and it's not circulating, how is a blood test going to tell me how much vitamin D I have? So I think there's a lot more questions than answers. And, and, and it's important that we don't silence scientific debate on these topics because, you know, to me, you can, you can define science with two words, asking questions. And, and we have a lot more questions than we have answers when it comes to vitamin D. So there's a question, would posture affect one's height? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You can, and, and it will also affect range of motion. And I'll do like a little demonstration sitting here in the chair, right? So, so if you have poor posture, if your shoulders are kind of hunched forward and, and you're hunched forward like this, right? And you go to lift your shoulder, it'll only go so far, right? It'll only go so far. Now, if I sit up nice and straight, it goes further. See how much more range I have? So a lot of the times people are losing range of motion because of postural positioning. Um, yeah, posture is huge. And many people think that, you know, they have to try to sit up straight and they have to try to get their head back and they have to try to get in these perfect postures. Well, a lot of the times what happens is because of gravity, if we have this forward head posture, gravity over the years is going to keep pulling it forward and down. So in order to fight gravity, we have to do things that helps our body to get back to that normal position. And the cool thing is, is it doesn't matter how old you are. I had a patient who was 90, I think she was 93 or 94. I don't remember exactly. Um, she was a Catholic nun. I loved her dearly. She was a spitfire and she did not want to have a forward head. And we measured her head when she, when she went against the wall, there was four and a half inches between the wall and the back of her head. That's how far it was forward. And within just about three weeks, we had her to like one inch away from the wall. So age doesn't matter. It's, it's training the body properly. And, um, and there are so many ways to improve posture and, and get that head back and not have things hurt um, that are really effective. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Lisa wants to know, are balsamic vinegars highly acidic? Oh, that's such a funny question because of you, AJ. I went and sought out balsamic vinegars and I've done research and I've locally found a few places. They're olive oil companies, but of course I skip that side of the room and I go over the, and I got to taste all these amazing vinegars. And I had to ask them because you had said you could buy a 4% acidic vinegar, right? And so I'm looking for this. And, uh, and, and when I asked the people in the, in the store, she said that they started off at 2% and then they aged them. So they might even be less than 4%. She wasn't sure, but they're incredible. They don't add any sugar. They don't add anything to them. And boy, I'll tell you, there's nothing better than a salad with a flavored balsamic vinegar. It's, it's, and they don't bite. They don't have that acidic bite. So because of you, I knew the answer to that. <laughs> well, great. And you're going to get two bottles just for being on the show of flavors of your choice. So that's, I'm oh so glad gosh. you're a fan of them. I'm so oh, happy. Oh, thank you. Oh, I feel like it's Christmas. That's wonderful. Ramona says, is arthritis reversible with a plant-based diet? So when the damage has actually happened to the joints, it depends on how far the damage has gone. Um, I haven't seen any studies that show that the damage reverses. However, the good news is I have seen many, many people, no matter how old they are, eliminate the pain. And that's really what we want, right? We don't want to be in pain. I had this one couple, they were from Denmark. Um, they were in their eighties and she had a, a history of joint pain. She was using a cane and she said, as long as she followed, she called it my regimen. She goes, as long as I follow your regimen. And for her, she meant no dairy. She had no joint pain. Once she eliminated that food, she had no joint pain and she was in her eighties. And, and I've seen people, and then, and I, I do want to add this because I forgot to mention this with the weight loss. Um, you know, I do a, well, I did when I could show up in person and bring food and everything, but the local community college, I would do a nourish away pain four week class. And I would feed people a four course meal every week because they could taste the food and go home and make the recipes and realize this was good. Um, but 
class number two, which meant it was only one week, these people were telling me, many of them were telling me that their pain was gone or radically improved in just one week of making those changes. So, so as far as actual joint damage healing, I haven't seen any data. It doesn't mean that it's not true. Um, it just means that the studies haven't been done or I haven't found them. How long are our parts supposed to last? Because I do know some people and they're not, they, they're not eating whole food plant-based diet, but that have never been overweight that still need hip replacements and knee replacements because they're bone on bone. Right. Right. And that's the lack of the whole food plant-based diet. Right. I have, and this is, this is cool because uh, when I did home care and when I did acute care, um, I met many people who were over the age of hundred. And I was shocked at how many people over the age of 100 were living independent lives, driving, cooking, cleaning, doing their own finances, shopping. And these people come to find out were eating really well their whole life. They had all their parts, nothing had been replaced. And I even had one person in his 90s who told me he'd never had back pain. So, you know, I ask these people a lot of questions, right? And if I'm going into their home, I'm seeing the bowl of fruit on their counter, not the, the, the baked goods and the sweets and the, you know, the other stuff, which I saw on the counters of people who were much less mobile and in a lot of pain. Terrific. Uh, Monarch says, does Eileen have any tips for someone overweight who is getting double knee surgery? Oh, boy. Hmm. So, I mean, I'm certainly not giving any specific advice. I have experienced patients who've had a double knee replacement um, at the same time. I did not see good outcomes there. So I don't know if this person is planning on having them both done at the same time. I have not seen a good outcome. Um, what I've seen, and I'm only gonna share my, my experience, right? I'm not telling anybody what to do. It's just, this is just my experience. Um, I have seen people who've had both knees replaced one, like maybe a short time or a year later. What I've seen, and this is interesting, and I can't really explain this. One surgery always went really well and the other surgery didn't. And it could be the same surgeon. So for some reason, one joint cooperated with the replacement and another joint did not. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a tough call. Um, Yes, you, what I have found is the weight loss, and I'm sure you can attest to this, you're the expert on this, on ultimate weight loss. I recommend your book to, to pretty much everyone that it's appropriate to recommend it to. Um, food really is the number one way to lose weight. It's not exercise. I've, I've come across so many studies and I've had so many people tell me, oh yeah, I've gained weight since I haven't been able to move because of my pain. And it's like, no, you've gained weight because of what you're putting in your mouth. It's not because you can't move, right? I mean, I've seen people in nursing homes, you know, they're, they're, they're 80 pounds soaking wet and they're in a wheelchair and completely dependent. Well, why don't they grow to 200 pounds because they're not moving? No, it's, it's, it's really food. So, um, I'm sure this person's watching you. They're going to get all the information they need that will help with that. Absolutely. But I highly recommend if you have a lot of joint pain, the melt method is very effective um, at helping with pain. I really do love it. And I have no affiliation with the website. I've just been a, a, a certified instructor for, like I said, about 11 years now. And uh, I use it. I teach it to everyone. It's a beautiful method. It's very helpful. Right. Thank you. This is an interesting question from Anna. Any advice you can give to high school students, especially girls that are forced to wear backpacks that are extremely heavy? I, I, I see. I used to volunteer in the school before a pandemic, and a lot of them just have like a little rolling suitcase. I, I don't know how you can legally force somebody to wear a backpack. Yeah, I agree. And, and I agree they're horrifically heavy. And the funny part is, is the schools are no longer even giving them books. So they're carrying binders for every one of their subjects, which are tend to be heavier even than a book, right? And they don't give them enough time between classes to go to their lockers. So they have to carry everything around all day. I agree, rolling them would be ideal. I mean, there's no, I mean, and younger people tend to do this anyway, because they're like this on their phones all day long, right? So, I mean, I see them sitting in the waiting room and I've, I've admonished more than one youngster waiting for a parent in the, in the waiting room going, oh, you're gonna be seeing me by the time you're 20 if you don't stop doing that. <laughs> 
but we got to, you know, get up. Those, those backpacks are horrible. I agree. They, they really need to be rolling them. Yep. That's what I've been seeing a lot with the, the kids, even younger kids. Uh, Chef Dell's watching and he says, I have worked with Eileen and learned the melt method and it really works. Maybe you could show that sometime. It sounds oh, like- Dell is one of my favorite people. Hello, Dell. How are you? That is so cool. Well, this has just been one, you know, I I mean, I'm really going to watch this presentation again, because when I'm, I'm also monitoring the chat, because it really was excellent. And I'm not just saying that you're just such a wealth of knowledge on this subject. And it was just a fabulous presentation. Yeah, I'd be happy to do one on obesity and pain. I've got lots of data. (laughs) <laughs> oh, well, I get, yeah, please, please. And, and maybe, I don't know if the melt method is something you can show, but it just sounds mm-hmm. amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I could definitely demonstrate and yeah. Share about it for sure. Yeah. That would be great. Well, thank you so much. And guys, check out her book and at least check out the free chapter. What do you got to lose? She's uh, so generous in giving it to us. So thank you so much, Eileen. This really was wonderful. And I'll get you those two free bottles of balsamic vinegar. Yeah, thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guest is Howard Jacobson and he'll be discussing his new book, You Can Change Other People. I can't wait to, I I find it very difficult to change other people. I don't know about you, Eileen. Well, Howard has a special way about him. So, you know, I mean, as you and I talked, you know, I know him and uh, yeah, he's, he's got a way about him for sure. And Josh Lajani was, was, I think the, the book that they put out, um, fit to fat to fit, sick, fat, sick to fit, sick to fit. fit. That's it. Cause I think it had changed a couple of times with the title, but, um, but he has a way about him and, and yeah, yeah. I love listening to his podcast. I, I can't. Yeah. That's how I, what's one of the ways I discovered you, you were on the podcast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, well, it's six degrees of separation. Thanks again. And thanks.